This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 15. Coming up on Space Time, counting down to a crash on the moon, the James Webb Space Telescope reaches its final destination, and the earliest known report of the mysterious phenomenon known as ball lightning in England. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A four-ton Falcon 9 upper stage booster will crash into the moon on March the 4th, hitting the lunar surface at over 9,000 kilometres per hour. The booster was part of a rocket launched seven years ago, carrying NASA's Deep Space Climate Observatory Discover spacecraft into orbit at the Lagrangian L1 position, a sort of stable gravitational well, where the gravitational pull between the Sun and the Earth balance each other out. Since that 2015 mission, the upper stage Falcon 9 booster has been in a chaotic orbit. And that orbit saw it pass close to the Moon on January the 5th. And this close encounter altered the booster's orbit, placing it on a course that will see it collide with the Moon on March the 4th, slamming into the lunar far side somewhere around the Hertzsprung crater. While the impact won't be visible from Earth, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and India's Chandrayaan-2 spacecraft should be able to image any impact crater created by the collision. Of course, spacecraft have crashed onto the Moon before. After all, people have been filling space with space junk for years. And scientists have even crashed some spacecraft onto the lunar surface deliberately. During the Apollo era, a Saturn launch vehicle booster was deliberately crashed onto the moon to test seismic equipment left by the Apollo astronauts. Those seismic measurements were used to help characterise the lunar interior. And in 2009, NASA sent a booster stage hurtling onto the lunar south pole in order to look for signs of water in the impact ejector. This is space time. Still to come, the James Webb Space Telescope reaches its final destination and the earliest known report of a phenomenon known as ball lightning in England. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has finally arrived at its new home, the Lagrangian L2 position, a gravitational well 1.5 million kilometres away on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. The final five-minute orbital insertion burned by its onboard thrusters placed the $10 billion observatory into a halo orbit around L2. Webb's orbit will allow it to get a wide view of the cosmos at any given moment, as well as an opportunity for the telescope's optics and scientific instruments to cool down enough to function and perform optimal science. The James Webb Space Telescope was launched on December the 25th last year aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. Mission managers have used as little propellant as possible for course corrections during the journey so as to leave as much fuel as possible on board for ordinary station-keeping operations over its lifetime. Meanwhile, the telescope's continuing the delicate three-month-long process of aligning its optics. James Webb's primary mirror is a a 6.5-metre diameter gold-coated beryllium reflector composed of 18 hexagonal segments. The telescope will provide improved infrared resolution and sensitivity over Hubble, viewing objects 100 times fainter. It'll look back through space-time more than 13.5 billion years, allowing astronomers to see some of the oldest and most distant objects in the universe, including the first stars to shine, the birth of the earliest galaxies, and the atmospheres of distant worlds which could support life. The James Webb Space Telescope is a feature in this month's issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. G'day Stuart, our cover story this month in Australian Sky and Telescope is all about the the next biggest amazing thing, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, or people just call it the Webb. It's uh, the next generation of orbital observatory. It's named after James Webb, who was an early head of NASA, and you'll sometimes hear it described as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. In some ways it is, um, as it's newer and bigger than Hubble, of course, but in other ways it isn't. So 
size is really important when it comes to telescopes, particularly the size of the, the main mirror. It, it really does matter with telescopes because the, the more light gathering power you have, the fainter you can see. And the fainter you can see means the further away you can see because things that are further away are fainter. So Hubble has a mirror that's 2.4 metres in diameter. The James Webb Space Telescope's mirror will be 6.5 metres in diameter. So, you know, it's much, much bigger, much bigger. Now, whereas Hubble was optimised to do its thing with normal optical wavelength, plus a little bit of ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths as well, Webb is mostly optimised to do infrared. Uh, now, infrared means it will pick up the light of very, very dim or, and or very, very distant objects. And what we're talking about here um, primarily, or, although it will do other things as well, but primarily it's, it's intended to look back through time, through the universe, to the emergence of the very first stars and galaxies. Uh, now, Hubble's taken us quite a long way back on that journey, but the James Webb Space Telescope will take us even further. The, the thing is that um, we've all heard of redshift. So what's happening is that the, the wavelengths of uh, light that were emitted by the first stars and galaxies uh, way back then were emitted at, at normal wavelengths, if you want to call it that. By the time they've reached us, they've all gone very infrared. So you need um, a telescope that is optimised for that. So infrared, you can think of it as just being heat. So in the magazine, we take a look at the amazing technologies that will make this telescope work, from its bold covered mirrors, would you believe it or not? The mirrors are not made of glass, they're made of metal, and they're covered in gold because it's uh, really good for uh, reflecting this kind of uh, these particular wavelengths. That almost goes and back to the times of the very first telescopes that used metals instead of glass mirrors. I think the Great Melbourne did. Telescope was like that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was made of it was called a speculum. Yeah, it was mm. um, made of made of metal. Um, the the particular metal they're making this one of, or they, which they have made this one, um, is 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 very low expansion. What that means is that um, as it heats and cools, which it actually shouldn't do much of, but it, as it does, it, it um, some materials will expand and contract when they're when they're heated or cooled. Uh, this particular kind of metal is meant to keep its shape. So you really want to keep the shape of a mirror as, as precise as possible. So you don't want things to be expanding or cooling with changes in temperature. And to, and to keep it at the right temperature, it's going to have this amazing stack of ultra-thin heat shields that will protect it from the, the heat of the sun. With infrared being basically heat, you need to remove any sources of heat from the telescope and its cameras and everything itself so that, that so those sources of heat don't overwhelm the very faint infrared wavelengths coming in from the things that you're supposed to be looking at. So it's going to be uh, in deep freeze and, and kept as cold as possible in order to do its job. So really amazing machine. Is that why it's located in the Lagrangian L2 position on the opposite side of the Earth to the Sun? Yeah, so with, with the Hubble telescope, um, it's just orbiting the Earth, um, goes around and around and around in mean, fairly low orbit, about 500 days or something like that approximately. And that's they, they did that with Hubble because they wanted to be able to get up to it with the space shuttle and do these periodic upgrades and, as it turned out, in the end, do periodic repairs as well. So that was brilliant for all that. And, and Hubble worked well because, as I said, it was mainly operating at, at what we call optical wavelengths, the sort of normal light wavelength, with a little bit of infrared, a little bit of ultraviolet. But because James Webb Space Telescope needs to uh, look at the infrared part of the spectrum, it needs to get away from all potential sources of heat, including the Earth itself. So they're getting it away from the heat of the Earth. Uh, the Earth just you know, reflects the heat from the sunlight and everything. Um, but, yeah, they just want to get it as far away as they need to from the Earth so that Earth's heat doesn't contaminate the, the observations from the telescope, but not so far away that it takes a long time to get signals back and forth, that kind of thing. It, it, it is so far away that they, you know, it's on its own. There won't be any repair missions or, or upgrade missions or anything like that. So once it gets out there, it'll be doing its job for hopefully decades um, just on its own. But that, yeah, that, that is the reason they got it away from Earth, is to get it, get it away from heat, basically. But it's not purely NASA, of course. There are other people involved, other space agencies involved as well. So it's an international mission. And just like Hubble, once it's up there, it will operate as an international observatory. As so many different scientific facilities all around the world, not just telescopes, but all sorts of other labs and things. These missions are so important and, and sort of one-off that they're not, they, they don't operate them as national facilities and only people from that country can, uh, can use it. So the way these sort of telescopes run is that once, once they're up and going, astronomers apply for their little slice of time to use the telescope and it's always oversubscribed. They always have you know, three or four times as many applications as they can handle. So 
uh, special committee sifts through all the applications and decides which ones uh, get the nod. And um, and yeah, people from anywhere around the world, scientists from anywhere around the world, basically can um, can use it. There's usually a little bit in the initial stage. Is usually a little bit of um, time set aside for the you know hard working scientists. Uh, who have been you know, working on this telescope for 20 years or so. They're, so they're the ones who they plus all the engineers and technicians and everyone. Yeah, people don't realise that. They think, oh, things going up there, it's working now, that's great. Next, it doesn't work like that. The people who built the thing and developed it and designed it and were commissioned to build it, this is a career, this is their entire career. It certainly can be, yeah. yeah that, that could be their life's work. So yeah. but generally there's a period of grace where um, uh, those people get the first crack at it and they can do their observations first as a, yeah, as a, a bit of a reward, if you like, and, and they get to... Um, uh, you know, sift through the data first and publish their scientific papers and then all that data becomes freely available to anybody after a certain period, which is usually about six months or 12 months or something. But um, yeah, after that initial period, anyone can um, will be able to uh, apply for time and um, if on, based on merit, their uh, applications might be accepted or not. But it's, it's, anyway, it's, it's got a decades-long lifetime, so there should be plenty of time for everyone to, to have a go. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing is easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. And this is Space Time. Still to come the earliest known report of the phenomenon known as ball lightning in England, and SpaceX's CRS-24 Dragon cargo ship successfully returns to Earth splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Researchers have discovered what appears to be the earliest known English record of a still controversial and extremely rare weather phenomenon known as ball lightning. Ball lightning, which is usually associated with thunderstorms, is unexplained and has been described as a bright spherical object on average around 25 centimetres across, but sometimes up to several metres in diameter. Emeritus Professor Physicist Brian Tanner and historian Professor Giles Gasper, both from Durham University, discovered a reference to an alleged ball lightning event while exploring a medieval text written some 750 years ago. The account by the 12th century Benedictine monk Gervais of Christ Church Cathedral Priory in Canterbury predates the previous earliest known description of ball lightning recorded in England by nearly 450 years. The findings have been published in the Royal Meteorological Society's journal, Weather. In his chronicle, composed around the year 1200, Gervais says that a marvellous sign descended near London on the 7th of June, 1195. He goes on to describe a dense and dark cloud emitting a white substance which grew into a spherical shape under the cloud and from which a fiery globe fell towards the river. The Durham researchers then compared the text in Gervais's chronicle with historical and modern reports of ball lightning. Tanner says Gervais's description of a white substance coming out of a dark cloud, falling as a spinning fiery sphere, and then having some horizontal motion, is very similar to historic and contemporary descriptions of ball lightning. Prior to this account, the earliest report of ball lightning from England was during a great thunderstorm in Devon in October 1638. The thing is, medieval writings rarely survive in the author's original version, and Gervais's chronicle and other works now only exist in three manuscripts, one in the British Library and the other two at the University of Cambridge. The text, which is in Latin, was edited by Bishop William Stubbs in 1879, and there is no translation into English. The researchers looked at Gervais's credibility as a writer and as a witness, having previously examined his records of eclipses and a description of the splitting of an image of the crescent moon. The study's co-author Gasper says that given that Gervais appears to be a reliable reporter, he and Tanner believe that his description of the fiery globe of the Thames on June the 7th was the first fully convincing account of ball lightning anywhere. 
As to what ball lightning really is, if it exists at all in fact, well, the mystery there remains. Emeritus Professor Robert Crumpton from the Australian National University, who's collected dozens of eyewitness accounts of ball lightning over many decades, says two main theories have been put forward to explain the phenomena. One hypothesis, based on the physics of electrical discharges, suggests that lightning strikes and travels slowly through conductive channels in the ground, generating a corresponding electric field in the air as it moves, and the ball lightning is formed from electricity discharging in this field. The other idea, which is more chemical and geological, involves lightning hitting a substance containing a 2 to 1 ratio of carbon and silica. The extreme heat of the lightning then converts these chemicals into carbon dioxide and nanoparticles of silicon, which puff out of the surface in the shape of a ball. The ball shimmers as the silicon oxidizes in the air, generating heat and light. Crompton says this second idea was given a boost by an experiment carried out by French scientists, which recreated silicon nanoparticles in the laboratory using electricity. However, none of this would explain reports of ball lightning passing through walls and entering buildings. Nor does it explain a well-documented case in suburban Canberra, where Crompton says a man was standing next to his garage door when lightning struck nearby. Shortly afterwards, he saw an orange-yellow ball of rotating light slowly floating towards him. It entered his metal garage through the open door and bounced twice on a board of wood before disappearing in a loud bang like a rifle shot. Crompton says the object left marks on the board which were later analysed by Australian Federal Police Forensics. They found the marks to be titanium oxide, a heavy metal used in some types of paints. But apparently there wasn't paint splash or spill marks as you'd normally expect to find in a garage. Crompton thinks the ball lightning was an ionised electrical discharge and in this case the lightning struck a painted pole with some of the paint being incorporated into the ball lightning. Another hypothesis involves rapidly charging magnetic fields caused by thunderstorms. Apparently, if these magnetic fields focused on the visual cortex of the human brain, they could induce eddies through transcranial magnetic stimulation, which would cause people to think they're seeing lights that look like discs and lines. And as the field moves within the cortex, the subject sees the lights move too. But this too is just a hypothesis. This is space time. Still to come... SpaceX's Dragon CRS-24 cargo ship successfully returns to Earth, and later in the science report, could the popular social media app TikTok be weeding its way into kids' brains? All that and more still to come on Space Time. SpaceX's CRS-24 Dragon cargo ship has successfully returned to Earth, splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico just off the Florida coast. The return had been delayed by two days due to bad weather at the splashdown zone. The spacecraft brought with it some 2.3 tonnes of returned experiments and space station hardware. The mission had launched 34 days earlier from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. 
just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 